so we're going to get started. So I'm Sharon Terry. I'm the founding CEO of PXE International. I'm going to say um, that I am in an interesting situation and that I am actually um, uh, working on this from Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, where my husband is in a very dire condition. And so I will be attentive to this webinar as long as I can. I think I will be able to do it for the whole hour because I have my son sitting with my husband. Uh, but if something emergency happens, then I will leave. Andras will be able to finish the webinar uh, fine, and then uh, everyone can just leave at the end of the hour, and it will record beautifully. It does that by itself. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Andras Svardi. Andras has worked with PXE International a very long time. Um, we've been very delighted to have him as one of our primary researchers. And in fact, he has made perhaps the most significant and important discovery uh, uh, up, uh, up to this point for PXE. So I'm very excited for him to share that information with all of us today. Andras, you can take it away. Thank you very much for the warm introduction. And indeed, it was always a, a great feeling to work with PXC International and, and to, to get the support. And also what I'm talking about is the work of many people, not only, and, and definitely not only my group. It, in the background, there are several other fantastic discoveries. You will hear about those in in coming seminars or webinars, I guess. But now I start to, to show what we found and we think it's important. And that will be a story of the long way to the oral pyrophosphate therapy in PXE, which is at the moment a hope, but all the research shows to this direction. And of course, and as, as Sharon told me, I will be very happy to answer your question when you interrupt me if you do not understand what I am trying to explain. So I go ahead and I have a very short introduction of the, of the disease. We don't have to, to deal too much with it because you, most of you know that it's a genetic disease from the point of view of the genetics, there are simple and complicated issues. Sorry, it starts to, to go ahead by itself. But in general, my expectation is that at least 10,000 or even more patients in Europe and at least five to 6,000 in the US plus Canada, maybe, maybe Sharon has better estimates. And also fortunately the life expectance of a PXC patient is not reduced. So they, the patients live as long as the normal population. However, the quality of their life is seriously affected, mostly because of the vision problems. At the moment, there is no consensus intervention or not intervention at all targeting the disease systematically. This is a calcification disease. And when I'm talking about systematic targeting, meaning that the calcification itself. And uh, I just jump to the next slide, but I stop here and, and ask whether all my slides are visible and my sound is okay. Yes, it's beautiful, thank you. All right. So sometimes from the point of view of science, but you can simply ignore it, there are, there are genetic models of tissue calcification. Tissue calcification is the major general problem in PXE. And I just listed PXE as a model disease because to support my findings related to PXE, I will use another closely related disease as well. But right now, let's see the, 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 the symptoms, what, what you probably know better than I do, because those are on the left panels of the, of the slide, are the dermal uh, uh, symptoms. And at the bottom of the left panel, there is a, 
there is a, an, an experimental visualization of calcification in the skin. Alizarin in red, what I will use later on, and other, other um, uh, stains as well, to show where calcium precipitates are present. And this is the major problem. But this, this problem is not limited to the skin. There are calcification in the arteries, mostly in the lower, uh, lower leg. And the most serious problem is in the eye, where the calcification ruins a, a tissue called Bruch membrane. And because of, because of, of this integration of the Bruch membrane, there is bleeding and there are new vascular, new veins or new vascularization happens, which starts to interfere with vision. So these are the three types. And behind those is the calcification, the uncontrolled, unregulated calcification. So from this point of view, I will talk mostly about calcification and how to slow it down. And just want to remind you that PXE is due in the majority of cases, I would say that 99% of the cases due to mutations in a gene called ABC6. So PXE biology has been revealed by many, by many researchers. And what is an important observation or discovery is that PXC what affects many organs in the body is a so-called metabolic disease, meaning that there is something most probably circulating, or we do know what is that, but I will show you that in the next slide. So there is a metabolite circulating all over in the body. And if this metabolite is not present, because mutation in the gene I told you before, ABCC6, the disease slowly develops. And Kuhn, who will talk later on from Philadelphia, discovered some four or five years ago that the metabolic background of the disease is the fact that number one, we knew that before, that ABCC6 is present in the liver. So it's an interesting feature that the, the protein who, whose lower function or, or non-functioning form is present in the liver, but the effect, is, the effect is present in the whole body. Therefore, we call it metabolic disease. Now, what Kuhn discovered that ABCC6 one way or another facilitates transport of a, of a molecule called ATP from the liver to the blood circulation. And ATP is a molecule which is, I would say it, it's, it can be split very easily to two halves. And there is an enzyme in the liver what does it. So immediately when ATP due to ABCC6 function comes out from the liver cells and enters in the circulation, the other enzyme, you will see that on the, one of the next slides, splits ATP or cleaves ATP to AMP and pyrophosphate. Now we will concentrate on pyrophosphate because pyrophosphate is a well-known inhibitor of calcium phosphate precipitation, or I would say more precisely, it's an in inhibitor of soft tissue calcification. What is the general cause of PXE? And when the level in plasma of PXE patients, when, when the level of pyrophosphate in PXE patients' blood or plasma has been measured first by Kuhn. He found that it is 
much lower than normal. It was, he found something like 40% of normal. And also I want to introduce you that in science, there are animal models and I will talk about animal models. The first has been created by Yoni Vito, who will be another speaker of this series. series. So Yoni's laboratory uh, developed a mice, what more, very similar to a PXC patient. The mice, that mice has a mutation or actually it lacks the, the gene. So it has non-functional ABCC6 and shows the calcification symptoms very similar to human. So in science, we use the animal models to try out or figure out all the details of the disease and try out novel treatment options. And the pyrophosphate level in the circulation is low in patients, as I told you before, and also equally low in this mice. So this mice or mouse seems to be as a perfect animal model to study the human disease. So what I try to explain you that PX is a metabolic disease, metabolic is pyrophosphate. We know that in the PXC, in, in PXC patients and the PXC animal circulation, pyrophosphate is low. Pyrophosphate is the, the physiological function of pyrophosphate is to inhibit calcification. So the picture comes together that we have, in the last few years, we understood a lot about this disease and the metabolic background. And now because ABCC6 in the, present in the liver, I'm going to concentrate for a minute to the liver. And this is a slide where you are, I ask you to concentrate only on the left side. On the left side, you can see that on the surface of a cell, this is a cell surface. A cell is covered by a membrane, a plasma membrane, plasma uh, membrane uh, um, territory, and ABCC6, our important protein, sits in the membrane and somehow helps to get ATP from the cell to the circulation. This is inside the cell down and the circulation is up and the cell membrane forms a kind of barrier. So if there is no ABCC6, ATP cannot go out. If there is ABCC6, ATP goes out. When ATP appears in the circulation, we are still in the liver, in the micro, circulation of the river, liver in the capillaries. There is another enzyme also sitting at the cell membrane and immediately when it gets ATP, this is an enzyme and cleaves ATP to AMP and pyrophosphate. This is the, these are the two key steps to get pyrophosphate. Oh, I'm sorry, it goes back sometimes. Sorry about that, my mouse is too sensitive. Yes, I'm here. So these are the two enzymes which are important to control the pyrophosphate level in the circulation. And if we have not enough of pyrophosphate, hydroxyapatite, this is the calcium form what causes the calcification of the skin, of the eye, of the arteries will be generated. So I hope that this is a, it's not a very simple scheme, but probably you understand that if we have, if we miss this enzyme, there is no ATP, if there is no ATP, no pyrophosphate, then hydroxyapatite can go fast. If we do not have this enzyme, then 
there will be no, no factory to cleave or to produce pyrophosphate from ATP. And again, the patient, which is a different disease, but related to PXE, will be sick. And that's what, what keeps, what, what you have to keep in mind, that the plasma pyrophosphate level in low in PXE and low in this little bit similar disease, what is a more serious disease, but also, also a calcification disease and also caused by low pyrophosphate level in the blood. I, I put together a very, um, a very simplistic, um, some kind of cartoon, because there were many research and speculations how pyrophosphate can stop calcium phosphate precipitation, how can it stop calcification in the skin, and so on. So right now, what we believe that when a microcrystal of calcium phosphate that is what I show on the left upper corner of the slide. So when a microcrystal is generated, and it can be generated even in the circulation or within a cell or anywhere, normally it would grow to form a large microscopic part, uh, precipitate what causes the problem. However, when one has enough pyrophosphate in the blood, pyrophosphate somehow covers the microcrystal. It makes a package around. And if the microcrystal is, is packed by pyrophosphate, by cover, it's covered by pyrophosphate, the crystal cannot grow. So it stays in the microcrystal form, what cannot cause any problem. So this is the simple, a little bit simplistic, but most probably true mechanism, how pyrophosphate can slow down or not slow down, but prevent calcification. And as I told you, pyrophosphate is due to ABCC6, comes out from the liver after, a, after one enzymatic step and present in the whole body. And if it's enough, there will be no calcification anywhere. So let's see how can we prove this. I show you on the upper left side the chemical formula, the chemical structure of pyrophosphate. It is very simple. One obvious, one obvious idea would be that if it's true what I told that low pyrophosphate triggers the disease or causes the disease, if we supplement with pyrophosphate, for instance, the PXE mice, what is shown on the right panel, upper panel, we, we should be able to prevent or slow down calcification. And this is an experiment has been done in, in uh, Olivier Le Sault's laboratory, and he will show you that experiment when he injected the PXC mice with pyrophosphate once a day for a, for a few days, the calcification showed down. If he injected just water, actually that was a, a, a neutral salt, not pyrophosphate, there was tremendous amount of calcification in that PXC mice when he daily injected pyrophosphate, the, the calcification was much lower, as you can see on the diagram. So that proves that supplementation with pyrophosphate is, is a cure. So the whole idea of what I showed you, that low pyrophosphate causes the disease, is proven from the other side that if you restore pyrophosphate level by injecting in this time the mice, you can slow down or, or almost completely inhibit calcification.
However, injecting pyrophosphate is not a, um, how, how would I go that? It's not a suitable therapy because PXC is a lifelong disease and pyrophosphate is a salt which simply cannot be injected to a human daily. So in this case, people would think about that the, long, the lifelong treatment, what is necessary, should be an oral delivery. Like normally, when anyone takes a drug, that's oral, very seldom injected. But by pyrophosphate, it's, it's, it's impossible. Now, here, is, here was a problem when I started to think about uh, how, how, could you, how could you manage oral pyrophosphate delivery? Because going back in, in scientific papers, going back 50 years, 1969, a very, very good group published that pyrophosphate is not active when given orally. And that was all over till 2016, so almost 50 years later. And other very competent group also published, and in between at least 20 different researchers published that pyrophosphate should be in a injected, what is not a preferable route in a, in a human disease, but anyhow, they say that it is inactive orally and they could explain it. Why? Because it's, it will be destructed within, the, destructed within the gut. So I was sitting in my laboratory and started to think or started to dream that it would be great to to develop an oral pyrophosphate delivery, but it seems that, that it's, it's not possible. So for this question, whether pyrophosphate substitution by oral delivery and, based, and to base a therapy on this uh, delivery is possible or not? And the answer was, it's not. However, I started to, to, to question this. I was not completely 100% convinced that all those 20 or 25 papers in the last 50 years were done on the correct way and so on and so on. I don't want to go into details why I started to hesitate to believe this dogma. And I thought that, okay, Instead of thinking, let's make the experiment. That's always helpful. So I went to the PXC mice and somehow we had to teach the PXC mice to drink pyrophosphate instead of drinking plain tap water. In a day, they started to drink it because that was the only available drink for them. And we started to see or started to introduce a calcification model. I don't want to go into technical details, but you can generate or induce calcification within these mice, and you can see whether the pyrophosphate, what they drink, interferes or attenuates calcification or not. And we were extremely happy maybe lucky that we did this experiment, and we were extremely happy when we saw the result. The result is shown on the right. So the diagram shows that if we put no pyrophosphate in the drinking water of the mice, of the PXC mice, there was a high amount of calcification. When we added low amount of pyrophosphate, what is shown here as one unit, we got a very nice reduction. When we increased pyrophosphate 10 times higher, the reduction was very, very nice. As good as I showed you before, when Olivier Lesseau and my postdoc went to Olivier actually to work, 
in at Hawaii. He went, she went there from, from Budapest, where we are now. And they showed that injecting pyrophosphate prevents or slows down calcification. And we found that you don't have to inject the mice. It's enough if the mice drinks pyrophosphate instead of drinking normal water. We were extremely happy. So these mice whose calcification went down tremendously had, had to drink pyrophosphate. And, and I stopped here at the, a, a, mo a moment before telling you that we felt that the dogma that pyrophosphate cannot be taken orally and it's not absorbed is, was probably not true. So we went on because we needed more evidence for that. And we went for a slower calcification symptom in the mice, which is not an induced calcification, but a spontaneously developing calcification in the hair capsules of the whiskers. This is sometimes, sometimes people think that that models of skin calcification in the human counterpart of the PXE mice. What you can see here, that unfortunately we had to wait 22 weeks to develop calcification, nicely visible on, on the middle panel as little red precipitates showed or, or pointed by arrows. And these mice had plain drinking water for 22 weeks with no pyrophosphate at all. The lower panel shows you the mice who drank pyrophosphate for 22 weeks long and the calcification was much, much less. And by a painful quantification procedure, we could measure the extent of reduction of calcification. What is shown on the right of my figure, that there was relatively, not relatively, a large amount of calcification measured when the PXC mice got no pyrophosphate and it went down to probably 30% or 25% when the PXC mice was capped on pyrophosphate. So this is an additional, I think, beautiful, uh, uh, beautifully proves that oral pyrophosphate works. Then I briefly go, go through on the other animal model. I told you that there is another calcification disease. This is called Gaki, generalized arterial calcification in infancy, a more serious disease, but somewhat similar to PXC because it also caused by low level, very low level, or basically no pyrophosphate in the blood. Here the calcification goes faster. I show you again the hair capsule calcification, the spontaneous calcification. You can see that if we added no pyrophosphate, there is tremendous amount of calcification. If we added pyrophosphate to the drinking water, now only for 30 days, the calcification was stopped, or at least I would say attenuated tremendously, as it is shown on the right. Then we have to jump to the arteries. So, so far I showed you the skin-like calcification. I want to introduce you how to work with the arteries and how to detect calcification in the arteries. This is the enlarged arterial system. On the left, there is the, where the heart is. And on the right is the end of the leg of, of, of an animal. So we were concentrating on the arterial system, which corresponds to the human leg. I made a blue square around. And what we did was exactly same as I showed you before. 
one group of animals has been kept on normal water and then other group of animal got pyrophosphate in the drinking water and nothing else. And what you can see is on the left panel, there is a enlarged, microsco enlarged and microscopic picture of a tiny little artery of, of the mouse calcifying because it was not treated with pyrophosphate. On the right, on the black, on the, actually that's the right black panel, you can see that this calcification, what are represented with, with pinkish red dots, is much, much less if the mice was drinking nothing more than pyrophosphate. And again, on the right, on the columns show that this reduction is really remarkable. Maybe it goes down, the calcification can be, can be suppressed to 15% of the original. That's a, that's a, that's a large, large uh, attenuation of calcification in the arteries. Very similar thing we, we have observed in the kidney. The control panel on the left shows an art, arterial, uh, enlarged arterial micro -arter, uh, artery in the kidney the black precipitation represents calcification. On the right, you can see a microscopic picture with much less calcification, and this lower calcification is due to the fact that our mice got pyrophosphate in, in, its drinking, in their drinking water. And again, when we measure that by by quantitative manner, the reduction was again very nice as it is shown by columns. So what we showed that in spite of the dogma that pyrophosphate will not be absorbed when we give it orally or deliver it orally, we showed that it's most probably not true because it was effective in two different animal models it stopped or slowed down calcification. And logically, if it does, it should be absorbed. But we asked the question that, is it the case in human? And, sorry. So then what we did, that we started to drink pyrophosphate. On the upper right panel, you can see that someone drinks red wine. That's not us. We drank pyrophosphate, which looks like water. But after the successful experiments, we opened the bottle of red wine, actually. So what we did that after getting the approval from the, from the uh, authorities that we can do that, we recruited uh, volunteers who were ready to drink pyrophosphate and we measured the plasma level of those people at different time intervals. Actually, that was members of my laboratory, including myself. So most probably I am the person who drank the most all over the world, pyrophosphate, because I was involved in many, many experiments, what I show you here. So what we have seen, and this is most important, that pyrophosphate is absorbed in human, not only in mice, but in human as well. And the left graph or collection of graphs shows individual absorption curves by different 10 or nine or 10 different volunteers. And we can see differences in absorption. What is, as we expect, because we are different, and people act on, on, on a slightly different manner, but in everyone, we could see absorption. On the right, we show that when different doses has been used, this increase of plasma level 
from the base from above the baseline was different. When we got a lot, this jump up was high. When we got medium, what is the green graph? It was medium high and so on and so forth. What we could get from this, these were averaged graphs. What we could learn that it's easily possible to restore plasma pyrophosphate level from low to normal or even above normal. That is very encouraging because I want to remind you that in PXC, the basic problem is that pyrophosphate level in plasma is low. So if on a simple way, just drinking pyrophosphate, you can increase plasma levels for a certain period of time and restore it to the normal level of above, there is a good hope it will work. That's what, what, what we are thinking. Okay, so if I go back to that slide, what I showed you before, and you don't have to read everything here, but there were many ideas. It summarizes the many ideas how to interfere, how to treat, how to treat PXC. Some of them is dealing with pyrophosphate, what has been discovered by Kuhn, and he will talk about that, as the central metabolite of calcification and PXC. What we think that the easiest way is the oral supplementation of pyrophosphate because it is possible and it works in animal models. And there are many ideas how to interfere with PXC, but our favorite is the oral pyrophosphate supplementation. And I am, as I am approaching to the end of my presentation, I want to share with you that there is a European initiative in three countries working together in Finland by the University Tampere Rare Disease Unit, in France, in two different university clinics and in the Netherlands, in Utrecht. And they try together to put up a kind of European pyrophosphate PXC initiative. And what is in the background? In the background that we together, I will be involved also not as a medical participant, but we will do some prepar preparative work, not preparative, but work before the clinical trial can be started to see plasma levels in patients and so on and so on. So I put together a few facts. Why, what are the pros and what are the contras to use pyrophosphate orally in PXC? So I told you that this is the native metabolite and we know what it does. So it's a physiological compound. We all have that and we, we know why it would be helpful. It is non-toxic. There is an FDA uh, uh, report card for that. It has a relatively or well, very high daily tolerable amount what people can uptake. It is a registered food additive since it's not toxic. toxic. And also that's, that's not that important, but there is a patent to use it for medical purposes. Now there are contras. One contra is that this is not registered as a medicine. Therefore it cannot be used at the moment. And probably we have to wait for evidence-based studies. Also it's a, there are other problems that I don't want to go into details because what I want to, to tell you that this European initiative, as I mentioned, comes will be hopefully executed on the same time in Finland on a coordinated way, in the Netherlands, in two different uh, 
university clinics in France, and we will do some blood assays and analysis in, in, in Budapest. And what I did that I called all the doctors, all these four doctors last week to see what do they think? What are the most important, what are the most important points to plan this clinical trial? And and one of them, one of the, the points what I, I will read to you is what they told that it's absolutely needed the clinical evaluation of oral pyrophosphate before any prescription will happen, mostly in order to limit the so-called self-medication practiced by patients. And this is a big issue because there are many problems what we already know and maybe we will learn later. And these problems to be solved without, before anyone takes regular pyrophosphate. Number one, that we do not know the dose yet. Also, there are potential side effects. This is a salt, comes with, pot comes with sodium, Maybe in the trial, we will replace the sodium for potassium. We have to think about that. So there are a couple of things which are not fully understood. Therefore, we have to work them out. Also, we have to work them out a phenomenon called pharmacokinetics. How high the level should be. How long the restored lever in the plasma should stay. And what is planned now in Europe, and it takes time before it would be, will be started, is a randomized clinical trial, because this is essential to understand all the questions I try to address, and also to see whether pyrophosphate, what is effective in animals, is equally effective in human. And also one of the, or, or the participants, so that the, there is a major problem to get funds for, for these studies, but we are working on that very hard. And if I can summarize what I did on the in point five, that altogether the pharmacokinetic studies and the controlled clinical trial, which is planned as it should be done or scheduled as it should be done, is before is 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 extremely important before we could conclude that this treatment is an evidence-based treatment. And, and basically, this is the final question that we want to get an evidence-based treatment. So this is why the European efforts of the three clinics and my laboratory is, is uh, initiated. And I think I'm at the end of my study. I think there was a turning point in my research when I questioned a dogma about the oral availability of pyrophosphate. This is not me, don't, 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 confuse, don't be confused. This is not, not myself on the, on the slide, but I also question not everything but this dogma. And there is a list on the right who worked on the project. You will hear on the up there is members of my group and you will hear a seminar from Olivier Le so and also Kuhn van der Wettering on different, on different aspects of PXC and pyrophosphate and so on and the physiology of calcification. In the middle, there are a few friends and famous scientists whom I discussed the work I told you and there Valuable advice is helped us a lot. And we have to mention how much 
the financial support from some Hungarian grants from NIH. And I put it on the last, but this was a very, very important, the PXC International support. So I thank PXC International and thank your patients to listen to me. Great, thanks very much, Andras. Um, and I, I do want to also um, thank the not only the people on the line, but all the people who will listen to this, because you're absolutely right. It is the donations of people with PXE and their friends and relatives that makes this kind of research possible. And while it takes a number of years, these kinds of breakthroughs are incredible. So um, we have uh, at least one um, question. Um, and by the way, we will conclude this webinar somewhere around um, 10 of or 5 of the hour because we actually have this line being used for another webinar coming up, uh, not on PXE. Um, so mm -hmm. the question is, um, Andras, did you compare the PPI uptake on normal mice versus the knockout ABCC6 mice? Yes, we did. I don't have a slide about that. We did. And we, number one, it was a complicated experiment. Therefore, I did not want it to show slides about that. Because in human, you can, you can synchronize drinking. You can tell for a human volunteer that please drink a glass of water with pyrophosphate. And then we measure your blood pyrophosphate content before and 15 minutes later, 30 minutes later, and so on, up to eight hours, as we did. You cannot do that with the mice. Some of the mice drink, some of them does not. It's, it's very difficult to control. So instead of that, we forced pyrophosphate into the mice in anesthesia, and we found very nice uptake in the plasma, and we have seen no difference in uptake in normal we call it Y-type mice, and in PXE mice. Now, the part of the uh, clinical trial will be to compare the same thing in human. So what we will do in not, hopefully in the next month or two, maybe two, three months, that Having in one of the clinics, either in Finland or probably in Utrecht, the, the approval by the authorities, by the uh, local committee, PXE patients will drink the same amount of pyrophosphate as volunteers, healthy volunteers in Budapest. The plasma samples will be sent to Budapest and we will compare whether the absorption is different in PXE patients and versus in human, in, in, in uh, non-PXC healthy volunteers. But again, going back right. to the original question, in mice, we see no difference. Okay, and I just want to also say, since lots of the patients, the vast majority um, are in the U.S., that there is going to be a U.S. trial uh, that will take yes. place uh, sometime in the next month or two, and we have approval for that as well. Uh, we expect that once we go through the first phase, we will then move to what's called, that'll be a phase one clinical trial, and then we'll go to a phase two and hopefully to a phase three trial. Yes, that's, that's going to be um, somehow by the involvement of the Philadelphia Center of Excellence. Is that correct? That is correct. And because there are some very, very important things that I won't get into on this call around exactly some of the things you put on the slide around the patents, et cetera, how we approach this is going to have to be very well coordinated or we will be lost in the sense of once this is understood to be a drug, we will lose the ability to control, for example, the price, which should be extremely low. What we've seen in other uh, instances is that yeah. a company gets involved or um, a, a group that doesn't understand how to navigate the regulatory authorities get involved and they don't make all the right moves first. So that's what we're working on is, is making sure that we have in place some assurances from the uh, Food and Drug Administration, et cetera, before we do the trial, because if we do the trial first and then uh, we will lose 
the ability to regulate, for example, the price when the drug is ready. So that's the sort of stuff that why PXE International hasn't just jumped out and done this trial is we're getting all of our ducks in a row. Uh, I'm saying that, Andras, for the people listening. And then there's a question about, oh, do we plan this for Australia? So I want to explain a little bit, and I'll do it quickly, about clinical trials. So in the first case, we only need a few people to participate in what's called a phase one clinical trial. Uh, that's typical for every disease. And that is just to show that, in fact, <clears throat> the kinds of things that Andras has been talking about will actually happen. So, for example, PPI levels in individuals' bloods will rise and that also the substance is safe. And as he mentioned, we're really lucky here because this is a food additive. It's found in Philadelphia cream cheese and sausage and so on and chocolate. And so it's already been declared safe. So we're okay on that score. In the second part of the of the system, we will do a clinical trial like we did for the magnesium trial, and we'll be looking there at one, two, maybe three centers. Uh, they will then administer it to some number like 40 or 50 or 60 people. Uh, we'll probably have a control arm, meaning a set of people who don't take it or who think they are. They're drinking just water and the other set are drinking pyrophosphate, although we'll have to make it taste somewhat different uh, than water. Um, and then those people will be the sort of guinea pigs, the mice, the experimenters, uh, mm -hmm. for then a, what's either call a phase three trial or what we're talking to FDA about is actually being able um, to go ahead and do um, some uh, distribution right after that. So to the question about is there something planned for Australia? No, um, because what we need to do is make this trial as simple as possible, as inexpensive as possible. And certainly for PXE International, that means j largely US-based. We're talking about at least one European site as well. Um, but obviously, anything we learn from the trial can be applied to people in Australia quite easily and the rest of the planet as well. So while you won't be invited perhaps to be in the clinical trial if you don't live in one of the areas where we have a center or at least a constellation of people, it doesn't mean you're left out. It means, in fact, that you would then get um, access as soon as we have access. And our plans are to make the access as widely as possible as we can. Yeah. But if I, if I, so, so, but I want to tell that I'm not a medical doctor. I understand a little right. bit medical trials, but in my, my view is that it makes a lot of sense to initiate both in Europe and in the U.S. because the regulations are different in Europe. And, and, yes, and, and, yep, and, and we're working with the be, European Medicines Agency as well. So, so Andres, I just want to assure people that, so PXE International and myself as part of the European Consortium are also working with the EMA. So both will happen, yes. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. And th those, those two efforts will be synergistic, I guess. But it, yeah. Yep. Okay, so um, we unfortunately have to... Um, move this line to the next conference call. If anyone on the call has a question that they feel wasn't answered, if you uh, would feel free to email me, I'll make sure the question gets to Andras and we can answer it in email and we'll add it to uh, the, the file of this recording. As I said, the recording and the slides will be available uh, shortly. Uh, Sam is actually on the West Coast and she does all of the, um, the work on this. Um, and so we will be making it available to everyone. We'll post it on the listservs. We'll post it on Facebook. It'll be in the newsletter. And as Andres has mentioned a couple times, this is part of a series. So we welcome you to the other parts of the series and to being able to uh, learn much more about PXE uh, together. Um, I really appreciate, Andres, your time. Obviously, your research has been incredible. We're really delighted to work with you. And we look forward to more work together. Thank you very much, and the same is true for my part. And thanks Great. for inviting me for the, for the webinar. Thank bye -bye. you very much. Bye-bye.